Can you really make $1,000 a month working as an artist from home? It can be intimidating and confusing if you're an artist and now the pressure of being a business person is thrust upon you. Maybe you've lost your job and you're looking for a way to make some income. Maybe you're nervous about the world in general and you would like the extra security that income from a side business would bring in. Well, in this video, I do a serious deep dive into how you can realistically make $1,000 US profit per month working from home. I'm an artist with a business background and I've been doing this for years. It is possible. Do not despair. Do not be intimidated. Let's go explore the world of home-based businesses for artists. Hey there, I hope you're having a great day and I'm really happy to do a long form video to talk about how you can make $1,000 a month. This is like a master class, a deep dive video, call it what you will. I get requests for these and I'm happy to do it and I think this is an important topic because people do get laid off and people do get injured and they're at home and they can still draw, they can still digitally create and they go, man, can I do something on the side? So in this video, I'm really gonna walk through sort of the idea of a business. There's a lot of people out there in the world that would like to start up their own business, but they don't necessarily have a business background. And so they're intimidated, right? Maybe you're watching this video thinking, man, I've never went to college or I never went to business school. And what do I do? How do I even get started with a business? So hopefully I can help preach a little bit here for an hour about how the world works in terms of starting up a home-based business. If you're wondering who I am, I go by Zen Online. Here's the channel at Zen Water Cooler. Feel free to like and subscribe and you'll get access to lots and lots of these videos. Most of them are passive income oriented. There's lots of things like Redbubble, Tee Public, Merch by Amazon. I've got another channel too and it's actually run by myself and my wife, Stacks, that's her online handle. So this this channel is called Crafty Stacks. And this is all videos that I do about artist resources. So these are things like Inkscape, Photoshop, public domain images, that sort of thing. Lots and lots and lots of videos there for you to wet your whistle in terms of making money online. So in this video, I'm not specifically talking about passive income, although it may come up. I'm talking here about how to make money at home in a home-based business as an artist. And I've got lots of different examples that we'll jump into. The first thing I wanna talk about though is why does somebody buy something? So this is gonna be like business 101. So the big question that we wanna ask ourselves is why do people pay for things, okay? So why do I go to the store and buy my Slurpee? Why does somebody go to the supermarket and buy their fresh fruit and vegetables? The number one reason is they themselves don't want to do it. So what that means is there's an old saying, if you have money, then you don't have a problem. So in other words, the money makes the problem go away. So examples of things that are like businesses where people are willing to pay money is taxes. Okay, people don't wanna do taxes. They don't find it an enjoyable experience. So they're willing to pay someone 50, 100, $200, go away and do my taxes. That's one example. Another one is pizza. You can make a pizza. You can go to the store and buy flour and oil and cheese and all the ingredients. And it takes you like an hour and a half. You ever have these pizza making parties? I hate them. I just, I would rather pay $8 and have somebody show up at my house with a pizza. Anyway, I'm not much fun, but my wife loves making pizza, but that's another story. Okay. The third one is Uber. And you know, if you're going to pay for an Uber, you could walk home. I mean, it's a, probably a marathon. If you're at the, out, out at the nightclub and you got to go home, it's 26 miles to get back home and you're not going to travel around with a bicycle. So you don't want to do it. So you're going to say, I'm going to pay someone money to provide me that that physical service or that physical product that I don't want. Here's another one of my favorites. This is an example, an electrician. I once tried to rewire a light in my bedroom and I wound up short circuiting the entire house. So none of the lights worked, but yet strangely, the refrigerator and the oven worked. Time to call the electrician. I don't know what I'm doing. So Moving forward, that was years ago, I don't want to do it. I would rather pay an electrician a couple hundred dollars and come in so they don't burn my house down rather than me have to try it myself. And here's the fifth one that hopefully is speaking to you, art designs. 
because you're an artist, you may have a blind spot. And what I mean by that is you may think that nobody wants to buy your art because you can make it, but other people can't. Quick example, friend of mine makes knitted slippers. I love them. I get a pair every year. My eyes light up at Christmas time. I can't believe how lucky I am. She thinks it's no big deal because she's cranking these things out every weekend. She's watching TV knitting, cranking out slippers going, eh, and I'm yelling at her. You need to sell these. People are willing to pay you money to get slippers on their feet. So art designs, art products, physical products, if you can make them, just be aware, not everybody wants to do that work. Not everybody wants to learn Photoshop. Not everybody wants to learn Inkscape. We do. I mean, that's why we're watching YouTube channels about it. But most people actually don't. They would rather just pay someone. You mean I can pay someone $23 and they'll get me a shirt with my cat's face on it? I mean, there you go. The other reason why people will pay for stuff is they physically can't do it. So think now in terms of they'd like to do it themselves, but they don't have the skill set to do it. Maybe they never learned it in school. Maybe they're physically unable to do it. Maybe they don't have the time to dedicate to learn how to do it, that sort of thing. Here's an example. Good old taxes comes up. Uh, maybe the reason it hits home with me is because I actually do taxes for my friends and family. So people will like pay me a couple of dollars or they'll pay me with a Slurpee gift card or they'll take me out to dinner maybe, but I do taxes and finance for my friends and my family, some of them anyway. And the reason is they never went to university and took a business class. They didn't take an economics class. They didn't learn about the way the stock market works or about the way the taxes work. So I'm happy to do it because I have that background. Plumbing. Even if I wanted to stick my hand into a toilet, I don't have the background to have learned plumbing to do this confidently. So it's a combination of, I don't want to do it, but even if I did want to do it, I can't do it. I didn't go to plumbing school for three years or two years. I didn't apprentice for 400, 500 hours. I don't know what I'm doing. An auto mechanic, that's another example of where someone has a specific skill set. Do you start, to, are you starting to see the trend here? People are paying money for a skill set. You know, when I take my car into the mechanics and they charge me $60 to change out, you know, the tires, they're, I'm not just paying $60 for the tires. I'm paying $60 for the tires and the idea that I'm not going to die on the highway because they're doing it correctly. That's worth $60 to me. I'm paying for someone's background at the dealership that they learned properly how to do this skill set that I'm not doing. Here's another one, and this one makes me laugh. The thing I like about these long form videos is I get to tell you a couple funny war stories here of my past. So I used to, before the pandemic, used to go on vacation quite a bit, used to travel quite a bit. I'm very fortunate that I've been to many different countries and I've got these two meatball cats at home that we look at, that normally we looked after, but when we travel, we pay someone money to look after the house and look after the cats. And uh, I've, I've, been reading like YouTube comments and there's people that talk about pet sitting and they go, must be nice. Pet sitting is not a legitimate business. And it's like, man, have you met my pet sitter? Like she drives a brand new car. She's about 23 years old. She put herself through university with the pet sitting money. And now she actually owns her own business as her own website. She's pulling in some large stacks of cash. Like pet sitting's a legit business guys. So anyway, I just use that as an example because I think some people think, oh, they're making $20 a year looking after their friend's cats. And it's like, no, I remember on Christmas day, she had about 20 clients and a team of people looking after these houses. And I thought, wow, you have arrived. Good for you. And of course the last piece, they can't do it are art designs. My wife is an example of this. She loves buying art but she's not taking a painting class. I'm in the same boat where I'm a digital artist, but I couldn't grab oil painting materials and start learning how to do oil painting at any significant level. So we got an oil painting for our house. And that is something that we, neither one of us, have the skill set to do. We were willing to pay money to have a proper oil painting in our house. So art designs are something where, again, don't discount if you can do it. Some people may not want to do it. Some people physically can't do it. They maybe don't own a computer. They don't own art supplies. They don't have an art studio. Okay, the next 
sort of business model that I'd like you to wrap your head around here is this triangle. It's a very powerful symbol here, the triangle. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is, is there demand for your business idea? So you may, you might be sitting at home thinking, I'd really like to create, you know, I really know how to use like a sewing machine. I'd really like to create some sort of product using a sewing machine and I'll sell it at my house and I'll make money and I'll make profit and that'll be my home-based business. You got to start really basic and ask yourself, is there an actual demand for it? Now we'll get into the meat and the potatoes of how to find that out. But the idea here is you got to ask yourself, does somebody actually want to purchase my product? That becomes the beginning of the triangle. Okay, you want to ask yourself that question. The second piece is, is there a barrier to how to make the product or getting the product to market? And if the answer is yes, that's actually a good thing if you can overcome the barrier. Okay, I'll have an example of this in just a second. And the third piece is the skill, okay? So the skill is, do does it take a high amount of skill? And if the answer is yes, and you have that skill, then that's, that's a really good thing for a business. So I've got an example here, and I'm just gonna use lawn care, okay? So lawn care is a home-based business. It's not an art lawn, it's not an art business, but I picked a business that's not art. So you can just see an example that's kind of outside of our scope. We may be a little in the weeds on the art stuff. So I wanna just pull back and go, okay, everyone knows about lawn care businesses, right? You see the university kid, he's out there with the lawn mower and the weed whacker, and he's out there taking care of people's lawns. So let's ask yourself this. How much demand is there for lawn care? I'd say it's like a five out of 10. You know, in my neighborhood anyway, there's some older folks who don't really want to do lawn care. There's some really big yards that people go, Ugh, I mean, even though I'm young and healthy, I don't really want to mow my lawn. We get a lot of, you know, weird weather. We get a lot of people going to vacation properties where I live. So it's like, I don't really want to be hanging out all summer looking after my yard. Is there a barrier to entering the lawn care business. I mean, I can't just go over with a pair of scissors and start cutting somebody's lawn, right? I need to buy a proper lawn mower. I might even need to buy a riding lawn mower. I need a car or some way to get my lawn mowing equipment or a van or a truck, some way to get my equipment to the house. So that's a barrier. Now it's not a huge barrier. I mean, lots of people where I live in Canada have cars, so it's not the, you know, the biggest barrier in the world, but it is a barrier. If you're 10 years old with no lawnmower and no car, this is probably not a great business model for you. And I'm living proof of this because when I was 10 years old, I tried to start up a lawn care business and I was very limited in where I could go because I was using my dad's lawnmower and weed whacker with no car. So it was pretty much limited to my immediate neighborhood as far as my little legs would walk me over to the neighbor's house to mow the lawn. How much skill is involved in lawn care? probably not a lot. And that's not to be insulting to anybody who does really high end, beautiful hedge trimming and lawn care. I don't mean that. I'm talking, look, I start, I did this business when I was 10 years old. Okay. So it can't be that high if me as a 10 year old was doing the business, right? It's not like this took a ton of skill. Yes. You need to know what you're doing and you need to pay attention, but I didn't go to school for four years in order to mow lawns. Right? So I would look at this all together and I would add these up and I would say, okay, is there a business here. Is the demand in my area sufficient or is it oversaturated? What are the barriers to entry? It, it, can anybody just do this immediately? You notice this in the pandemic, right? If you go onto Facebook, there's lots of home-based businesses where you kind of go, well, anybody can do that. And then when you ask them, they go, yeah, business isn't so good. Well, because it's saturated, there's no barrier to entry. Is there an opportunity locally for me to do this? That's the, the business matrix that you would run through. Here's another one that we can take a look at. How about making meals? This is a popular one that you may see on Facebook Marketplace, for example, or local classified advertising. Hey, we've got home cooked meals, cookies, muffins, specialty meals, gluten-free meals, that sort of thing. So let's ask yourself, how much demand is there for making meals? Now, look, this is my opinion. So if you're making meals and you're having a successful business, please do not be offended. I am just using this as an example to teach. I'm not in any way trying to disparage any business that may or may not be running. Ask yourself, is there a demand for making meals? What is the barrier to making meals? 
and is there a skill in making meals? When I'm talking about barrier, it's like, okay, do you, you like you need an oven, right? Or like you need mixing supplies, you need a house, you need a kitchen or an apartment, like you need some way to make the meals, right? So sometimes if you're making specialty meals, you would need a specialty machine. I'm thinking of, for example, pasta, like spaghetti and noodles, a lot of people will sell specialty products. Okay, we got gluten-free, hand-ground, stone-milled, made by monks in Tibet, amazing 45 different grains, you know, and it's all holistic and it's all organic. Well, you're gonna need a specialized machine for that, right? Like, or you're gonna need a specialized skill. So the idea is these two kind of work in tandem with each other, the barrier and the skill. So let's ask ourselves, and again, I don't want this to sound insulting if you're making meals at home. You might be making a killing, and I'm, I'm way off on these numbers, and if so, so be it. By the way, making meals is so vague, the type of meal might make these numbers radically different. In my area of the world, the demand for making meals is relatively low. When you compare it to, say, food in general, the idea that I'm going to pay someone to make a meal, I'm not aware of anybody in my immediate vicinity, my friends, my family, my mom, my wife, my friends, nobody's paying money to get meals made for them. But look, you might live in another part of the world or have a friend base or have access to areas of the world that, that need this skill set, in which case you would increase this demand number, which is great. What's the barrier for making meals? The type of meals that I eat personally, I'm basing this number on. I'm basing it on my skill set. I eat like a hamburger, a hot dog, pizza. I might have like salad. So I'm not eating specialized meals. But look, if I already live in a house that makes gluten-free stone milled wheat, okay, well, that's, I might already have knowledge that, you know, that it's helpful for me to start up a business. And I go, man, I can make specialty foods because I'm already doing that. Maybe you're a big juicer and you've got lots of juicing machines and you're all into the wheat powder and the whey powder. Well, good on you. Then that barrier is something that I wouldn't personally know about. So you could modify these numbers. What's the skill set in making a meal? I personally think it's you know relatively high. I think that you know having really high end meals served to people and delivered fresh and hot, or at least you know fresh frozen and you know quality meals that, that's kind of hard, right? So I think you know I, maybe I just don't like to cook. Maybe that's what it is, right? So I put the skill level up above. But anyway, my point is you're going to use this triangle, and then you're going to ask yourself what is the probability that me personally could make this business work. Here's the third example we've got. I've actually got a friend of mine who makes custom tables, end tables, coffee tables, dining room tables, kitchen tables. They're glorious, they're beautiful, they're works of art. I would love to have a coffee table book about his coffee table, but it's his coffee tables are so beautiful, I don't even wanna put a book on it. Okay, these things are expensive. He handcrafts them in the garage. He lacquers them. They're amazing. So ask yourself, is there a demand for custom tables? Well, in my area of the world, there is. There's stores, specialty stores that sell custom tables. I see ads for them on YouTube and on uh, Facebook. And locally, I'll see them at craft stores. I think the barrier for making a custom table is quite high. You need woodworking background. You need an actual workshop. It's sometimes dangerous work. You're working with power saws and tools. You need access to legitimate pieces of wood, big, expensive pieces of oak and pine and fir trees and like all sorts. I don't even, I don't even know wood. You can tell I'm not a big wood guy here, but the barrier to entry here is pretty high. And I think the skill is very high as well. The knowledge that this person has to create these joint cuts and dovetail cuts, and he's making the table balanced. And when you put something on the table, the table doesn't fall over. Like this guy knows what he's doing, right? So to create a thousand or two thousand or five thousand dollar table, this is a home based business that he's got that not everybody can just jump into. 10 year old me is not cranking out custom tables, okay? In fact, middle-aged me is not cranking out custom tables, but I'm willing to pay money to get a beautiful work of art in my home, and that's certainly a home-based business. So if you've got a woodworking machine, a metal machine, there's lots of different machines that you can buy that, that increase the barrier of entry for other people to copy and rip off your designs and also sell exactly what you're selling, and, that, and that's a good thing. So here's the way you'd wanna think of it is, you start with the demand and then you say, what are the barriers? Can I overcome that barrier 
of entry? And then do I have the skill set or can I acquire the skill set in order to make that work? What it comes down to in the real world here is that if you're going to set up a business in any way, whether you're delivering food or whether you're mowing lawns or whether you're an artist, and that's the focus of this video is providing value as an artist, is can you provide value? Is somebody willing to pay the money to get the product in their house? See, the thing about art that's really, it's not frustrating, I guess, but it's a challenge is art is not a consumer staple the same way that say food, shelter, clothing, like I'm talking bare necessities. Like everybody needs like a shirt. Do they need a shirt with a picture of a cat on it? Probably not. They can just go to the local store and buy a white t-shirt. So why are they going to spend more money with you? That's the question you want to ask yourself. Do you have a specific niche? Do you have a specific skill set? Do you have a specific machine that makes things differently? And that's what we're going to be talking about in this video with artist businesses from home. So there's another type of matrix that you can run here for businesses. So you start off with asking yourself, is there a high enough demand for the product that it's worth it for you to pursue all the other steps? So it's like step one, step two, step three, step four. Don't even go past step one if there's no demand for the product. Now you may not know, you may have to make an educated guess, but ask yourself, is anybody buying a similar type of product anywhere that you could ship to? Or is, does anybody have some sort of interest where they're liking things on Facebook or they're sharing funny memes and you're like, oh, I could put a funny meme on a candle or I could make yarn, you know, cat slippers. Like, is anybody ever owned such a thing? You wanna ask yourself that sort of question before you jump into the deep end of starting up your own business. The next thing you wanna ask yourself is, what are the actual barriers of entry? And when I say barriers, I'm talking about big picture, machinery, a house, office space, an apartment. Like if you're gonna run a business where you're selling hundreds of items a month, you're gonna need dedicated space. So you'd wanna ask yourself, can I physically, regardless of my skill level, can I physically make the products that I'm being required to make if I were to run that business? Next up is the skill. And this is a big one and it's often overlooked. A lot of businesses fail in the first year. Now the reasons they fail could be very different from one another. So I don't wanna just lump them all together. But one large reason that businesses fail is because it's too easy to replicate. What happens is someone online is selling a funny t-shirt with a cat design and then all of a sudden a month later, there's three more people selling the exact same design on the exact same shirt. And it's like, well, that's not a trademarked item. Then they don't have a lawyer team, a team of lawyers to go after them and say, hey, I'm gonna sue you. So it's like, well, I guess I better come up with some other designs. So if you're selling physical product of some kind and you're making it yourself, that's really hard to replicate. If you're using print on demand technology, that's really easy to replicate. So you wanna have some sort of skill and some sort of barrier that's going to ultimately give you that fourth step, which is profitability. You wanna ask yourself too, is there enough of a margin for you to actually make a profit? And this profit one sometimes gets overlooked too. So you wanna ask yourself, is it profitable in the long run? Are you doing all this work and making $5 a sale and you're driving all across town? Well, that may not be worth your time. So you need to factor these four things in. What we're gonna be talking about now going forward are these two ideas, the barrier and the skill. So one way to look at it is if you pick high demand and you're able to somehow acquire the technology to overcome the barriers and you're able to overcome the skill with your internal skill, like your internal skill set, then chances are good that you'll at least make some profit. Now this is a judgment call as to whether or not it's gonna be profitable enough so let's talk here about barriers and skill set in a bit more detail. A barrier you can overcome with money, okay? A barrier is physical limitations of the business. And these are not negative things if you can overcome them. They're actually positive things. Think of the person that makes the high-end tables, okay? Not everybody, like people want to, people want to make high-end tables. They go, wow, that looks amazing. I wonder if I could make that. Well, they find out pretty quickly they can't, 
At least that was my experience. Oh, you got to go to the hardware store. You got to buy wood. You have to figure out how, to, how all this works. Like the barriers to entry were just too high because I don't have a working workshop with a power saw and a liqueur machine to finish off pieces of wood. It's not going to happen. You can overcome a skill deficiency, not just with money, although you may have to buy a program here or there, like software program, but you can overcome the skill set with time and with effort. Now I'm going to jump into 10 ideas and these are just brainstorming ideas. But when you look at these, think of barrier and skill. In fact, you may want to, this is just an idea. You may want to grab a piece of paper and write barrier on the left and skill on the right. And as we go through the 10 different examples, give it a scoring out of 10, put down three, four, five, seven, whatever the number is for each of these and ask yourself, can I overcome that barrier? And could I overcome the skill deficiency? In other words, could I make it using something that somebody else can't? If you're doing brainstorming, an easy way to do it is to go onto Etsy. The reason I like going onto Etsy specifically versus other websites is because Etsy will show you actual sales data. So for example, here is a poster print and it says your city, it's customized. And then there's just map, just a picture of a map. It looks like Paris. And then it says any map, there's 5,800 sales. It sells for $35. Now it's on really nice paper and everything. And there's some beautiful mock-ups. This person's done an amazing shop. There's Detroit, Tampa, Cleveland, and there's 474 reviews. It's in demand. 13 people bought this in the last 24 hours. That's 13 people times $35. Now I'm in Canada, so you know you can do the conversion if you want to check out US dollars, but $35 is, that's a pretty good chunk of change over the last 24 hours. So this is just an example of where you could offer customized maps. And if you're good with Photoshop or Inkscape, you can make custom designs and then you can get them printed at a local print store. Here's another one. This is Matisse. Looks like they've redone the font on this and they've got a Matisse picture in here. And this is an abstract print, 16 by 20, 38 sales, relatively, you know, low, like a, a newer sort of uh, Etsy shop here. And don't miss out, there's five available and five people have this in their basket. So what I'm looking for when I'm doing brainstorming is I'm looking for an a art seller that's got a lot of sales. And then I'm also looking for how many people have this either in their basket or they've purchased it in the last 24 hours. That gives me an idea of its relative popularity. And then I ask myself, can I make this myself? Is it a public domain image? Is it something I could recreate myself? Can I do the custom work? Do I have the technology? Do I have the skill? That's what I'm asking when I go through these examples. With all the talk of print on demand, and technology and global fulfillment. There's something about someone that can sit in a room and still knit or sew, and it's amazing. So if you have that skill set, you have a license to print money. Here's an example of Christmas stockings with somebody's name on it, and these are selling for $83 each. Other people want this, nine people have this in their baskets right now. 28,000 sales. 28,000. So here is Santa chimney, different Santas. Now look, they may be buying the actual stock, like the actual stocking, and then maybe they're embro embroidering the name on it. But hey, if that's the case, good for them. I mean, whatever you need to do to get to the finish line on these things. But the idea is they're custom, they're in demand. I can't make them, so there's certainly a barrier to entry. And I don't have the skill set because I don't knit, I don't sew, I don't use an embroidery machine. So this is an idea. If you do any of this, that's a big time opportunity. Here's another one where we've got personalized slippers, your text here. Now this looks like some sort of a print fulfillment setup, but that's fine by me. So here they've got a whole bunch of different colors. They probably order it and then they get the text stuck on the front, which is great. Again, 21,000 sales and these are a little over twelve dollars here's flip-flops you can get flip-flops printed with the person's name written on the flip-flop One hundred fifteen thousand sales other people want this over 20 people have this in their basket if you can do custom flip-flops 
you are making some serious coin. Buying a 3D printer can be an expensive venture. You also have to buy the material you're using when you do the 3D printing, but you can create amazing works of art and also utility items. Forget about the art, just utility, utility items that people can use day to day. So here's just an example. This is a holder for somebody's firearm, Glock compatible pistol stand and it's 3D printed. The stand is what they're selling for $15. You can select a color and then you can have it come out. There's the different colors here. And then there's the actual stand itself. And that fits. I guess somebody would have that sitting on their shelf. But they would use that with, oh, here it says conveniently show off. We won't judge you, your Glock. <laughs> so they're selling, I mean, there's 43 sales. They've come up with a demand. Somebody out there wants to show off their gun. And so they've got a, a, a stand. Here's a vase. So, you know, this is limited edition. They've got a 3D printer where they've created these. These sell for $33.30 and it's a bestseller. There's over 9,000 sales. They're going to hit 10,000 sales here pretty soon. In demand, over 20 people, over 20 people bought this in the last 24 hours and that's times 30 plus dollars. So that's $600 they made in one day. Now, of course, it's not all profit, right? But I mean, a 3D printer, the actual resin is not super expensive. The machine is, mind you. But I mean, these are gorgeous, right? I mean, obviously, they've got a good thing going here. The nice thing is they set up a system and then they're cranking out cactus heads here and people are interested in it. Here's 3D keychains. So the idea here is you can customize these based on people's names or if they've got a saying, you know, a short phrase that they want to put in there, $3.74. This is 570 sales and you can select your option here and then they're selling them right on Etsy. But again, you could bypass Etsy. You could sell it on Facebook Marketplace. You could just sell them to friends and family to start off. You could have your own website. There's lots of different options. I'm only using Etsy to show that there are proof here that there's sales and reviews of the item. I talk a lot about making t-shirts, but it doesn't need to be through print on demand. Here's an example of a handmade tie-dye t-shirt. And you could make these yourselves. This is 35,000 sales. And look, they might be using print on demand technology here, and that's fine if they're doing that. They might have put, say, a tie-dye print on top of a shirt, uh, but that's fine too. You could make this though yourself if you want it. There's tie-dye of all sorts of different makes and models. This is a $45 item, a sweatshirt, and there's 596 sales. Other people want this. 17 people have this in their baskets and there's lots of different types. They've got a system here. They've said, okay, we've got certain types that we're good at and we're going to recreate this now either through print on demand or through making it ourselves. Here's Groovy T Kids Purple Tie Dye. Moms love buying stuff like this for their kids. There's certainly a demand here. Other people want this. Four people have this in their basket and 7,400 sales. Now, again, you can use a print on demand technology for this, or you can just make this yourself. So there's a store, I'm, I'm in Canada, so I'm using a store called Michael's, but I've actually done this myself. There's all purpose liquid dye that you can buy for making tie dyes. There's even tie dye kits and they're not super expensive. And obviously if you got really good at it, you would buy large vats of this dye. You'd go out to your garage. And I actually did this when I was about 20 years old. I made a hundred tie dye shirts out in my dad's garage and I then sold them at flea markets. Um, so this was a million years ago when I was a younger, more energetic person. And there was no print on demand back then. But this is what I did. I went to a craft store. I bought 100 cheapy shirts. And then I tie dyed them all myself, just about passed out from the fumes. But hey, I didn't know what I was doing. I was having a blast though. And I made some pretty good money at the local flea market selling shirts that looked very similar to this. Big funky colors. Now we live in this day and age where you can do print on demand. But hey, you may want to market it as homemade not print on demand. I'm making these myself and that might be a niche that customers might be interested in. So here's an example of a high barrier business. This is a person that has some sort of a woodworking machine and they've put a design into the machine with the 
pictures and the names and they've customized it. They've got 8,400, almost 8,500 sales and these wooden signs are absolutely gorgeous. And they sell for, right now it's on sale, they're about $65. And you can see here buyers are re raving. So you can see now there's even pictures too. Like people have, you know, pictures up of what the signs look like. So again, this is not passive income. Like you're taking custom orders. You have to connect with people. This is like a job, right? But if you're looking for a side hustle, this is a great way because the barrier to entry is so high. Like I don't have a woodworking machine, right? So, I mean, I can't make something like this. Here's a custom sign that's more just like a farmhouse design. It's white. This looks like it's print on demand, which is fine, but there's two different options. There's portrait and landscape. $40, get you a custom sign, 7,700 sales, over 20 people have this in their basket right now. The idea is that it's custom so they can get exactly what they want. They're working with the producer to make it perfect for them. You can also type in things like metal cutout sign, wood sign, things like that. This is a metal sign, Adam's Barbecue. Now look, it's not cheap, it's $116 Canadian, but it's absolutely glorious. I mean, look at that. I mean, can you imagine? You've got that hanging on your wall. So again, this is a metal cutout and this person has a home-based business. They're saying, look, here's the type you can buy, tell me what you want and they'll give you a quote. There's lots of 50, you know, 56 shop reviews, lots of shop reviews. What I like about the shop reviews is that there's pictures. So you can see exactly what this person made and you can see the variety and you can ask yourself, okay, could I ever recreate this? Could I buy the technology and then could I acquire the skill or am I doing something similar already where I could then have my place in this market as well? So if you've never seen a Cree cut machine or a Cricut machine, this is what it looks like. It's kind of looks like a little printer and it's basically like a digital cutting machine. So the idea with a Cree cut machine is that you get all these little tools and all these little things here, and then you wind up printing different things on either cardboard, paper, fabric, and you're able to do really intricate images. So here's an example of what you can use. This is like a laser cut that they've built. So they've built this. So you would print this out, assemble it together, and then you would sell it. Now, they're selling the file here for $3.64. So this is just an example of the product that you could make. You'd, ha you'd hang this up in like a kid's room and you know, using this file. So I'm not suggesting you sell the file. I'm saying you would make this actual product and then you would sell this to the mom who then puts it up in the kid's room. Here's another example. This is a bedside lamp. You'd actually put the bulb in there and then you would build this using that Cree cut machine. So it's like a physical product that you're creating, but they, you would actually, you'd buy the tool here for $3.64. You'd buy the design, you'd buy the Cree cut machine and the Cree cut machine's not cheap. You can get it for 286 bucks Canadian, $200. The really high ends ones are like 400, $500. And then there's knives and there's cutting tools and there's all sorts of different things. So you kind of, it's like printing, it's like 3D printing in the sense that you would use a computer to get a design, but then it cranks out these individual pieces and then you would assemble them all together. So it's like laser sharp. Here's another one. This is a lamp that you would use. You would build this and then you'd stick like a light bulb in the middle of it or a candle or something, right? But the idea is that you could build cool things that are laser cut and you can have really intricate designs on them. So if you're into the Cree cut game or the cricket game, it's something you'd think about, but that's the barrier to entry is you need to come up with about 500 bucks and then you also need to learn how to use it. And so if you can get that down though, this can be a really lucrative business because the harder it is to learn, Think of it as like a mountain, right? The harder it is to scale the mountain, the more rewarding it is when you scale that mountain because other people would rather just pay you $30, $40 for a really nice, cool design come to life rather than learn how to do it themselves. If you're involved in hobbies, things like action figures, 
vintage board games, dolls, high-end collectibles, that sort of thing, then this might be for you. So here's five Star Wars Black Series six-inch figure stands. You're like, what's that? Well, if you have an action figure, you can put them on a stand. That little clear disc at the bottom is actually a stand that somebody has gotten printed either with a 3D printer or they've used some sort of resin mold and they've created that. So a set of five, they sell for $12, more than 17, sorry, more than 700 sold. Here's another one. This is a reproduction of Skeletor. And if you've never heard of Skeletor, um, in the 1980s, there was a big cartoon and a big action figure line called Masters of the Universe. Well, there's a reproduction of the sword. So it's about $10 US to buy the actual reproduction. So somebody used a resin mold and they've recreated the sword. The thing is, lots of people have the old action figures, but they've lost all the accessories. Sometimes the accessories don't even exist. This is a He-Man, who's the hero of Masters of the Universe, and they've made a villain axe to go with the hero axe. So it's the He-Man axe, but they've made it the Skeletor colors. So again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, not a big deal. But my point is, if you're into Star Wars or G.I. Joe, Transformers, Masters of the Universe, whatever it is, you can use resin molds and you can actually create reproductions of the accessories that are in the action figure pack. It's not easy to do, but you can create the molds or you can use a 3D printer and you can create reproductions. These are consistent sellers. You can see here Repro Man has a seller rating of 4,100 on eBay, which is insane. That's a huge rating, so good for him. And this is a business this guy runs out of his house. He does you know, custom orders. He does you know, different action figure brands and he makes reproductions. It's a great side business. This next genre is pretty wide open and I've done it that way on purpose. I've just gone into Etsy and I've typed in the word custom and that's it. I've just let the search do its thing now. So the reason I did that is I think it's important to see all the different types of designs that you could customize because we may be thinking of things like jewelry and we go, oh, you can customize jewelry? Oh, we may be thinking of shot glasses and it's like, oh, we can customize those? Coffee mugs, t-shirts, art prints. Somebody has come up with a way to take you and your spouse and your dog and make it a Simpsons-esque picture. Someone has come up with the technology to put your name or a phrase on that certain type of water bottle. The idea is that it's customized. People not only want the product, they want to have their name or their spouse's name or their funny phrase on there. So I would just encourage you to take a look through here and see all the different types of customizable items. So I'm not searching for a specific product, I'm just typed in the word custom and that's it lots and lots of items and then you can go through and say okay can i make that myself can i come up with a sticker a label a digital print a print on demand a woodworking machine an engraving machine a 3d printer some sort of painting can i do something where i'm putting my skill on top of a physical product and i'm coming up with custom ideas If you're really good at doing something, knitting, sewing, then you may want to, in addition to selling your physical goods, you may want to actually teach people how to use it. So here on YouTube, I've typed in how to use a Cricut machine, and I can see all the different results that come up. So there's the DIY Mummy, there's Crafty Lumberjacks, there's Ann Makes, Christy Kane, there's lots of different types of videos. So that's an idea. So you would make money by doing YouTube videos and then you would eventually monetize your channel and then you would make income off of the ads off of YouTube. Again, you'd have to provide value here and this is a long way to go to make some money. But even if you never monetized your channel, you could still make money. Here's for example, how to tie dye a shirt. And if you did enough of these videos and you just promoted your own business in the video, you say, hey, by the way, guys, I have a website. It's so-and-so's tie-dye t-shirts. People will watch your video and they'll go, wow, that's how you make a tie-dye shirt. And then they'll just buy a shirt from you. 
So it's advertising. A lot of plumbing and electrical channels on YouTube are actually just businesses that are actual electricians and plumbers, and they're teaching you how to do stuff. And people go, huh, that guy really knows what he's doing. I'm going to pay him to come unclog my toilet. So this is an idea here is you can teach people how to do stuff. Here's how to build a custom table. Well, I may watch the video and just realize I'm never going to make a custom table. It's just way too hard. It's never going to happen. And I'll just pay this guy to do it. So if he's a local seller in the area, I may look at that as an example as well. There are stores you can go to where you buy beads and lots and lots of beads. And then you just get like a fishing line string. It's like designed for necklace or a bracelet. And then you can make your own jewelry. It takes time and it takes skill and you'd eventually get fast at it. But if you want to see examples, go on to Etsy and type in beaded. That's the keyword. And then you can scroll through and you can see all the different examples of jewelry that's available. This is a high, it's a high demand market, but there's also a lot of suppliers, but that just speaks to how high demand the market is as well. So here's an example, traditional beadwork necklace, absolutely beautiful, $85, only one available, only one left and one person has it in their basket. This person's made 13,000 sales. That's the beaded necklace, absolutely beautiful. The nice thing is, is you can make these on the side you know, if you have a job, you can work on it in the evening and then sell them on Etsy or sell them locally when they're made. Or you can do custom work. Somebody could ask for something specific. Here's an evil eye necklace, $19 in demand. Six people bought this in the last 24 hours, 1200 sales on this type of necklace. I don't want to say this in any way to be diminishing, but what I'm saying is if you have the skill, this is relatively easy to do. So I'm not suggesting any bozo can start cranking out beaded necklaces, but what I'm saying is if you're already doing this sort of thing, if you like beadwork, for example, like I don't, right? So like, like for me, this would be really hard, but if you're doing beadwork anyway, this is relatively easy to do because it's just a line with a bunch of beads on it. This would be like, I think super difficult, but maybe you don't. If, you, if you're doing this for fun anyway, and you're like, man, I make that handbag all the time. I make that necklace all the time. Then sign up, get up there, start selling. What are you waiting for? You don't need to be watching me. You need to be out there selling. Here's another one, pearl beaded necklace. Again, it's, it's technically relatively simple. It's just different colors of beads and it's one string, $80, three left, two people have it in their basket. It's awesome. There's a it's like an anklet. This is around the lady's neck. Bracelets. The possibilities are endless here. That's an awesome, very simple, elegant looking design. Okay, so hopefully you found those examples helpful and your brain now is swimming with all the possibilities of matching up your skill set with a possible demand out there, plus your interest and your time. Because after all, you want to have some fun, right? I mean, you don't want to be in some horrible sweatshop all day long making designs that you absolutely hate. So I've got five tips now on how you can actually get started. So let's pull all this together. Tip number one, brainstorm. Sit down with your loved one, with your coffee, with your cat, with your dog, with the mirror, and ask yourself, do I really want to do this? And if the answer is, I kind of need to do this because maybe I lost my job, then pick something that you think you're good enough at and that you would enjoy enough that you can do and not be horribly depressed. What you want to do is have something that you're actually legitimately excited about. You want to say, man, I, I work on knitting all the time. I didn't know that anybody wanted to buy my stuff. That's what you're hoping for. But at the bare minimum, you have to say, okay, am I good enough at this? And is there enough of a demand there that I can do this with a workmanlike attitude and I can get enough high quality product out there to make some sales? Tip number two, you want to have realistic expectations, okay? So it's kind of like, you know, for example, here's a guy mowing, like I've got a picture of a guy mowing the lawn. And the reason I've got that is when I was a kid, when I was mowing lawns for my Slurpee money, my Slurpee and my chips money, this was my 10 year old self doing this. I didn't really have realistic expectations. I legitimately thought that I would stop going to school in like grade seven and I would have a lawn mowing business. Now I didn't have a car. 
I was using my dad's lawnmower. Like you kind of need to rein it back a little bit and start off small. So have realistic expectations about what your actual business is. Can you ship items? If you're selling really large metal signs, it's going to be really expensive to ship. So just be aware of that. If you're making candles, be aware sometimes the candles are going to break in transit and you may have to eat some cost and do replacements. Like there is, there are costs to running a business. So have realistic expectations and factor those in. You're going to have to deal with some crabby people. You're going to have to deal with some, you know, really high maintenance customers. Just have realistic expectations that it's not all going to be fun, but that's okay. Hey, if you can get past those barriers, then you're laughing because you know you have something that people want. Number three, you're going to have to promote your business. And this is a big one for people. If you're a shy person or an introvert, this can be literally panic inducing where you're saying, I, that, that's it. I can't do it. I, I can make the product, but I can't promote it. If you're ever wondering, like, is anybody out there like me? They don't like promoting guys. That's me. I'm the guy that doesn't want to promote stuff. So the whole reason I've teamed up with my wife stacks on crafty stacks, that other channel is because I don't really want to promote stuff. I'm no good at it. I don't like really like social media. I'm not on social media. So I teamed up with somebody that I love and trust and they're going to promote the stuff. So I've got multiple websites that sell multiple hundreds of products. She, she promotes them. So if you're not into the promotion piece of it, team up. Team up with a friend, team up with a loved one, and maybe you can run a business together. Otherwise, you do have to promote your business. And that means going on social media like Facebook, Instagram, telling your friends. Maybe you're printing off flyers and going door to door and you're dropping them in people's mailboxes. It's okay to hustle and ask people, are they interested? It's not charity. If they want your product, they will buy it. Tip number four is be dependable. And what I mean by this is, if you say you're going to do something for a client, you must do it for the client. And we run into this so often in our society. Hey guys, join me at 7 p.m. for this live sale I'm going to have on Facebook. And then we join it and it's like, oh, it was delayed. My kid got sick. And it's like, oh, you're not serious. And I get it and I, and I understand this is where people, their arms go up and they go, hold on, I'm outraged. How dare you say I'm a working mother? I, I get all that. But as a customer, just be aware if you cannot meet your commitment, you will lose sales and your business may go under. So all I'm saying is have a plan and be realistic that if you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. I ran into this when I first started. So I'm not saying this is any sort of judgment. When I first started, I took on custom work and I'm a, like a illustrator. So like I'd sit at a table and I draw like superhero pictures, comic book covers, that sort of thing. And I did a lot of custom work and I was totally unrealistic on my deadlines. Oh, you want that in 30 days? Not a problem. Well, I should have said more like eight weeks because now I'm working all day long in a job and I'm spending six to eight hours a night drawing, inking, shipping items. And I'm going, I, I, I need to revise my timelines. So be dependable because if you delay orders, even if it's beyond your control, customers will get angry. The fifth tip I think is the most important one and it's to work at it. I have a picture of the space shuttle here for a reason. And the reason is that huge tank, see that big orange, huge tank right in the middle. That's all fuel just to get that space shuttle out of the atmosphere and into space just to kind of get up high enough that it can orbit the earth. All of that fuel is just to get a little bit tiny above the clouds. It's going to take a ton of work for you to start a business. You have to get momentum going. You're going to do a whole bunch of work for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks with nothing to show for it. Nothing. No one is going to care and it will be depressing. And you'll sit there shaking your fist at a cloud going, why am I doing all of this work universe? And then one sale happens, two sale happens, 10 sales happens. Then someone comes out of the fog and says, hey, I've got a stag party. Can I order 30 shirts from you? Hey, can I order 100 stickers from you? Hey, I'd like to order 15 candles. I run a local boutique store and I'm going to stock this. Things do start happening, but you've got to work at it. You have to grind every day, an hour a night, two hours a night, this is your full-time gig if you're not employed, right? If you don't have a job, this is your job. But you're not going to get payoff for it right away. 
And so that's the last piece of tip that I want to, you know, tip that I want to give you guys. Last piece of advice is you really, really have to work at it out of the gates to get momentum going. And once you get momentum going and you prove to the universe that you're reliable, sustainable, high quality, good customer service, people will talk. They'll say, wow, that's the one that I want to deal with. It's a competitive world out there. So you have to be slightly better than your competitor and you have to control the things that you can control, which is your professionalism, your positive attitude and your work ethic. So I hope you guys found that helpful. I very, very much appreciate your time. And I wanted to give you guys the, the time that's due on this in a long form video, because this is important. And if you're stressed out about making money, just know this is possible. You can do this. There's real evidence on Etsy and on other websites that people are really making money doing this for real. So I hope that helps guys. Feel free to hit that like button, that subscribe button, leave me a comment or a question. I'm happy to help. And I really hope you got some value out of this today. Thank you so much for watching.